Good evening. My name is Barbara Velasquez. What a pleasure to welcome you again to Hispanic Latino Heritage Month virtual programming. Hispanic Latino Heritage Month, designated as September 15th to October 15th, recognizes the achievements and contributions of Hispanic and Latino champions who have or are inspiring others to achieve success. The 2021 national theme for Hispanic Heritage Month is Esperanza, a celebration of Hispanic heritage and hope. This evening, we will watch a documentary and then share in discussion with the film's associate producer. During the viewing, I encourage you to write down questions. Consider what is new information to you. We will have a prize drawing for those who offer a question. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off, but you may always contact the hosts. And at any time this evening, please send your questions to moderator Barbara Velasquez. I will share your questions with the discussion leader after the film ends. Also, we will put a link for an online evaluation of today's program in the chat. If your email is included in your Zoom account, the link will also be emailed to you. Completing the evaluation and including your name and contact information may qualify you for recognition throughout the year. Tonight's documentary is titled Landfall. While the devastation of Hurricane Maria attracted a great deal of media coverage, the world has paid far less attention to the storm that preceded it a $72 billion debt crisis crippling Puerto Rico well before the winds and waters hit. Landfall examines the kinship of these two storms, one environmental, the other economic, juxtaposing com competing utopian visions of recovery. Okay, so thank you so much everybody for your attention to this amazing documentary, Lale Namebu Pastor was born in Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico, to a Dominican mother and absent father. Lale completed undergraduate studies in photography and art history at the University of Puerto Rico and continued academic studies in film production and direction at the New York Film Academy in New York City. Currently residing in Puerto Rico, Lale is a musical curator in the subversive queer scene, archival researcher, and video producer. Welcome, Lale Nameru Pastor, a Caribbean activist, videographer, editor, sound person, advisor, compañere, Turba, and possibly everything that fits between those labels. Welcome, Lale. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I'm humbled. Thank you very much. It's quite the honor to have the associate producer. So everybody, you know, you can send questions. We have a few to get started. So as a Puerto Rican who grew up in Puerto Rico, what did it mean to you to work on this documentary? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I am 34 years old, so I am from the generation that has lived the collapse of what was the imagination of the Puerto Rico dream and the economy and the and and the raging. Nine and, and 80s and 90s, we had an economy that my generation starts seeing the complete collapse of it. So I've always had in my mind and imagination that a great documentary or a great series, TV series would be <laughs> a great way to, to show and to showcase what was going on in Puerto Rico because there's so many things um, that happen in this colony. And 
right after Hurricane Maria and when in, in Irma as well, I was like, what, what else can happen in Puerto Rico? Like, what else can, can we go through? Well, I, I can answer that question. We even had earthquakes on 2020. Um, but, but I remember saying like, this is this 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 is a TV series. This is a nightmare. <laughs> this is a horror story. And I remember being with with no no um, no hope. And I met Cecilia a few months after the hurricane passed, and she was starting to put together this idea of documentary to try to inform a little bit more that is not, was not just a natural disaster. And I said, well, I, I studied film. I, I was a, a film school dropout, but I did study film and, and, and I study photography and, and I do a lot of things. So I don't know if you would like my help and support, I would love to. And she was like, no, I want you to work with me. And we embarked in this journey to put together this documentary and and I didn't know I needed so much to tell this story. I didn't know that I needed to heal. Um, I, as I started healing during the process, not only producing it, but after seeing the different cuts of how it was getting put together by, by Terra Lee Jung, who is our editor, she's from Canada. And seeing the story being put together, it's, it's, it's my story, it's our story, my friend's story. Um, it was a healing process and it was very important to also name the different um, success or different things that we had passed through. And, and it was really important, especially for healing after the hurricanes of 2017. Thank you. So, in every disaster, there are people who come in to take advantage of the people. Some examples that we saw in this documentary were our government taking advantage, the rich wanting to use people for their tax gain, swindling people who trusted others, lack of total respect for the people of Puerto Rico, um, not counting their dead from Maria. Um, and, and then you, we, we saw so much. We saw how the island was used to conduct war exercises, to pollute beautifully natural land. So in your, from your perspective, Lali, how did, how did, was this allowed to happen? The parts that happened during Maria or after Maria, how, how did the people get in who were causing trouble and taking advantage of others? Were people paying attention? Did, did the US government not protect? Its I people? think it's, it's similar as e even before Hurricane Maria, the government, the system allows it to be an open door for anyone to come in, especially people that are searching for easy ways to make money, or easy ways not to have to pay taxes. Um, we are a fiscal paradise. So it's a very sl a small percentage that you need to pay in taxes if you come to Puerto Rico. So even before the hurricane, we already had uh, tons and tons of, of, of outsiders coming in and buying up everything. <laughs> basically, also the government did um, this law that basically the entire archipelago became almost the entire archipelago became an opportunity zones and i call them opportunist zones so basically the entire island is on sale to the best buyer um so i think especially during the hurricane because we were in survival mode we couldn't pay attention to anything else just to survive. And, and the government knew that, and this fellows knew that, um, some of them, because I, actually I, I sometimes do believe in the best of people, and maybe a few of them did come with a good heart, but didn't understand what they were doing and how they were just helping disaster capitalism. And, and I think it's just, basically uh, uh, 
uh, different uh, laws and, and different, uh, the, the system protects them. The system brings them in, open door, come in, this island is for you, not for us. It's, 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 that's one of the things that I, we, me and my colleagues have also thought about the fact that we sometimes believe that they have indoctrined us to believe that we are not worthy of living in, in Puerto Rico. Who is worthy is the white man with money, the investors, the people from outside. So I think during the hurricane, those those months afterwards, we were so desperate to find help and support anybody who would come in. We would actually also let them in, and that's how they they took advantage. They took big advantage of that, which is the worst worst type of people. Marta would like you to know that she has been to the island to visit her husband's family, and the island was amazing. Until this film, however, I had no idea of the trials and tribulations that the Puerto Ricans experienced, the horrors depicted in this documentary. How do people still have their loving spirit? <laughs> That's an amazing question. I, I, I sometimes joke around saying that to live in Puerto Rico is, is an extreme sport. Every day is something new. Um, it's exhausting. We're not resilient. We're exhausted. I also say that a lot. Um, it's it's. I don't know how, but we have a good spirit. We have we we are fun people, but we are really tired. And I think it's also. I would say also it's also part of being colonized that sometimes we don't put a big importance of everything that's going on to us. We don't even know what dignity is to like, like what the term really means, dignity. I don't think we actually understand that. We haven't even actually grasped what dignity is. We've been a colony so, so from, from Spain and then the United States. Um, I, I also had a friend who was telling me he was from Argentina. He was like, why do people are like mad in Puerto Rico? Do you actually have reasons to be mad? And I'm like, well, we have tons of reasons to be really mad. Um, but but yes, I think also a really important thing is our geographic position. To be in the Caribbean makes us very happy persons. Um, to live on the coast, usually we are, people tend to be more happy. That's something that we know from the Caribbean. We're loud and musical people. Thank you, thank you. Um, I would like to note that there's such poetic phrases throughout this documentary that really stuck with me. I'm um, right at the very beginning, my cat became a different animal. You know, and that just left me thinking, okay, what's going on? You know, um, that the movement from poverty to the guys trying to sell the luxury, right? The luxury um, condos, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote down another one. Um, Hurricane Maria cleaned or swept away the beauty and helped us to see how screwed we were. You know, just, I mean, it just, very, very poetic and very uh, powerful because it leaves us all thinking. Uh, really want to congratulate you all for- Thank you so much. Being, uh, um, so whenever we see documentaries, we know that there's that production time and everything. So we can't be sure that we're seeing what the current situation is. Can you tell us post Hurricane Maria, is there pro any progress or are, are, are there still people without electricity? Well, actually after Hurricane Maria was what we saw at Ricky Renuncia, which was the big revolts and the protests that we actually took down um, the elected governor, Ricardo Rosselló. 
And then we had a series of earthquakes in January of 2020. Um, they were really, really powerful earthquakes. Um, the southwest part of the island was really affected. Many people are still without houses. Um, it's not actually covered by media, but we still have camps of people not living inside their houses. Um, so we, we went through that also, also the, the COVID situation has been really hard for employment in Puerto Rico. And we're currently starting to see the money that was directed for the recovery of Puerto Rico. So that money is starting to be um, divided to different organizations and municipalities and different projects around the archipelago. So now is that they're starting to talk about the recuperation and reconstruction of many sectors of the island. Um, we actually are, big parts of the archipelago are without electricity and we're having a power outages at least once a day in basically all the archipelago. Um, I, I, th this is why I have this little setup in my room with uh, my computer all charged up and my phone near because light can, power could go out, go out and I just turn my phone on and I can connect again. So it's, it's it hasn't been a, a lot of progress since, since uh, Hurricane Maria. Many people would say, oh, please, Lale, there's been a few progress. But if you measure it with what I was saying about what, what is the standard of dignity that we, we uh, made a same of what we actually need, should have, um, we still have a lot of people with blue tarps on the roofs, um, no electricity, um, potholes everywhere to drive here. It's putting your car in danger. Um, it's, it's a lot and corruption is everywhere right now in our government. So um, also for LGBTQ community, especially for trans folks. Um, we're tr there's a few projects right now on legislation and 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 are about to take more um, rights from the LGBTQ community. So it's it's an extreme sport to live here, and day after day is something new. Um, we might feel sometimes that we we advance. We have to say that um, in the past few months, COVID cases dropped drastically. We tighten measurements and things uh, went down again. So thankfully we're stable on that side and paying a lot of attention to what's going on with also the debt in the United States and how that is gonna affect us because that's also gonna affect Puerto Rico. So paying attention to all of that. And, and yeah, I think, uh, I don't wanna be a pessimist but <laughs> there's not a lot of progress right now but there's a lot of social justice groups, a lot of uh, community organizing. Um, so there's a lot of hope also, a lot, a lot of groups of different ages coming together and trying to support each other. And then that's very important. The, the teachers are right now fighting for their pensions. And I, and that's, I think the, the biggest part of my positivity is that we haven't let go. We're still fighting and we're still here. We're still organizing. That's, uh, you know, I think that it, across many communities, we feel that the next generations may have the answer. We're hopeful, right? Um, what do you attribute the money becoming available now to? Is, are there some reasons that it's appearing? I think it's just bu bu bureaucracy. It took way too long. Um, also, um, how do you say subasta? Um, uh, they need to, you need to, to propose to get a hold of that money to show the organizations, what are, what are the projects that you wanna do and and th that takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of time and it shouldn't. Uh, municipalities have been asking the local government, please, please plead the United States to, to put this money on, on, like to already have this money. We need to reconstruct our municipalities. 
especially municipalities from the southwest side with that, that we also went through the earthquakes they really need to take uh, to be able to use this money for their municipalities and i think the most simple thing is bureaucracy it's way too complicated so sometimes when we have questions come in it's interesting to kind of weave them together and i see that happening now um we are far from Puerto Rico. This group of people, most of us listening, I think are here in the middle of the United States. And maybe we've had the pleasure and joy of visiting the island and have dreams of going back. Um, you've opened our eyes um, to realities. But what recommendations would you have for those of us who live so far away? What can we do to impact our fellow citizens in Puerto Rico? Well, I think most importantly, if you see a news of Puerto Rico, share it, read it, share it, pass it along. It's very, it's, it's strange that we get to be on news in, in the United States. So if you see a news, share it, pass it along. Right now, there are different legislations that are going to, um, I might say this wrongly, but I think it's Congress, um, which is about uh, Puerto Rico self-determination. So that's very important to talk about. Um, the people from Puerto Rico, we, we are supposed to be the ones to decide what we want and, and, our, uh, and determine what we want, um, not anybody from any other place. Um, so I think that's very important. I know that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was and Media Velasquez were trying to put some uh, legislations to try to help some projects uh, that wanted to give Puerto Rico a uh, plebiscite to decide. But we we every four years with our elections, we also vote if we want to be part of the United States or not. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we say. It's what the government of the United States decide. But I know that there's been some talks in Congress about self-determination. So I think that's very important. Puerto Rico it, it needs to be able to decide them ourselves uh, what we want and, and what's going to happen uh, with us. And if we want to be independent, if we want to be a state, or if we want to stay how we are right now, which is a commonwealth. So I think it's very important for us to be able to decide that and um i think not only puerto rico is also um any community that are going through difficult events uh capital disaster capitalism it's also happening in new orleans it, it and that's a little bit near uh you guys um you all and and i think it's it's starting to see how oppressed communities are are falling through this capitalism and, and through all this um this uh, sorry my english today is not functioning well <laughs> but um i think it's it's to understand that what we're what's going on in puerto rico it's not only going on in puerto rico laws like the 20 and 22 that bring um people from from outside of puerto rico to invest are happening in many other places also in states of the united states gentrification is also going on and I imagine also you have cities in Nebraska who are going through gentrifications, many places as well. And, and I think we need to start talking about that. How do we protect our communities? How do we protect ourselves and support ourselves? I think um, mutual aid is very important. And that's what actually I would say saved us during our difficult times of the hurricanes and also during the earthquakes. And also during the COVID pandemic, when we were completely um quarantine mutual aids people would cook for everyone they took meals to their houses bring different uh, sanitation products um so i think it's the solidarity mutual aid and solidarity uh, i strongly agree that there's a lot that you watch in landfall that reminds you of other atrocities Right, um, it's an unfortunate common human uh, reality, right? 
So um, we're coming to the end of our time, but um, I, I would like to ask you if you have any words you'd like to leave with us. I, I believe that we've been so, um, so enriched by this. I, I should, somebody wanted to know if the water, all those bottles of water were just thrown away. They were thrown away when I was one of the persons that actually went through and got to where the waters were. And the waters were had been under sun and rain so much that even if you stepped on them, they would just disintegrate. So you can imagine how long those waters were being piled up. I think that was one of the most difficult parts of, of recording. I, I remember not having water to drink during the hurricane. Uh, months. And I remember knowing people not having water for even more months. So to see that and actually having them in front of me and seeing the dates of the papers that were due for the hurricane was 2017, that I crumbled down in that moment. So I think the bottle of waters are, that were one of the things that actually made people really, really mad. And also the telegram chat from Ricardo Rosello talking about the people that actually passed away during Hurricane Maria and making fun of them. So I think those were the two things that made people really mad and hit the streets and actually happened what 2019 summer revealed. We can organize and we can do amazing things. Thank you so very much for being with us. Um, it, this, first of all, it's an honor to have an associate producer, but um, Beyond that, all the experience and your ability to articulate what, what is the reality has just been really powerful for us. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you to the audience. Um, you come back, uh, you, you share um, with others to participate in learning about important, situations basically around the world. And we were really, I'm impressed. I see faces that are there commonly and it's really good to see all of you. Thanks to the audience and everybody have a nice evening.